Radical Srafa. Um, this is the fourth of five videos uh, that we are developing um, the classical theory of value distribution with respect to the slideshow presentation. As with all the videos under the dialog box, uh, you'll have access to the video, to the slideshow. Take it, cut, a, 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 download it, use it, okay? Um, it's important that we are able to teach ourselves uh, economic theory, um, again, because of the fact that economic theory um, is more than just one approach. And I think that that's really something that uh, I've said in the previous lessons, and I just want to make sure that in every video it's said that there are, multi there are many approaches to economics. Economics is not only about decision-making uh, choices under constraints, okay? I mean, I just, it's, that's one approach, but that ain't the only way we could think about economics. And I think that that's something that, again, that as a species, we have to reclaim, uh, the human beings have to reclaim that and force the uh, academic economists to reconcile with that and to reckon that and to, once again, bring the classical approach to these matters a back to fruition, the modern approaches that we're doing, and demand that diversity also include diversity in terms of theoretical uh, 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 interpretation as well. All right, it's it's our world depends on it. I mean, we can't just rely on these these bozos who are just going to you know be arguing that only one approach is what well, bozos a little bit extreme. But I, I, it, it's upsetting that people are so arrogant that they think that they can uh, uh, you know dismiss an entire. Um, uh, the, the entire history of what the science is about and, and people, or ignorant, all right? You don't have to assign nefarious motives to it, but um, I think that that is even, you know, for those that are ignorant, don't be so, you know, learn. <laughs> and then maybe we could do something, right? So in this video, what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be introducing the corn economy, right? So now we're in, in the previous three videos, we looked at the, um, at the relation of unassisted gold product, I mean, unassisted, uh, of production generally. So we had a model of unassisted production where we had unassisted wild strawberries production, which had a profit factor attached to it, and unassisted gold production, which did not have a profit factor attached to it. The profit factor for the unassisted labor model uh, was the was the exploitation factor or the ratio of distributed share factors, one plus E. Here now we're gonna mom, we're gonna model the same relation, except for now we introduce the uh, assistance to the labor, right? So here we're gonna have means of production. So we could say it's the assisted labor model. It's gonna be the corn model here <coughs> in the production of corn. We have corn as seed. That's going to be equal to the means of production. So now we're going to have the means of production. So with the means of production, we're going to have a profit rate as opposed to an exploitation rate because now we're going to be able to have a, um, a, a, a quantity in the denominator or the profit rate is going to be the value of the means of production. And we have an upper and lower limit to the profit rate. The lower limit to the profit rate is going to be zero, just like the rate of exploitation. But whereas with the rate of exploitation, the the, uh, the, uh, the, the maximum value was infinite, right? It was infinity for the rate of profit. I mean, for the um, assisted corn model, the maximum rate of profit is a determined quantity. It's the maximum rate of profit, which is also equal to the output capital ratio. For the one commodity economy, it's the output capital ratio. For a multi-commodity economy, it's going to be the standard ratio. And again, this is what, what Srafa is, um, is doing. So in the above model, we is, they had the unrealistic assumption that output is produced solely by unassisted labor. But of course, now there is a production of corn. The, we need seed. Um, so we are now introduce the input of seed. And so now we're going to have the means of production. It's going to be the letter A. It's going to be circulating capital. All the seed's going to be exhausted in the, um, in the round of production or the annual harvest. This then becomes our, um, our, di our schematic, our diagram. We have the, the single product industries, uh, the single round of production, beginning of the round ex ante, end of the round ex post. Now you can see we have the seed requirements. So I, the, the corn I'm going to put in the rectangles in terms of the quantities, and then the labor I'm going to continue to have a circle. And then you can see the corn to seed input, which is going to be equal to A, which is equal to five quarters. And then the labor input, I'm actually going to stop this. All right, this is what I wanted to do. All right, we're going to come here. This is actually one hour. All right, this is going to be one unit of labor, which is going to be here. All right, and so we'll come from the current, right? And so that then becomes the, um, 
That was a mistake from before. Okay, that becomes the, uh, the labor input, right? And so that's going to be associated with the output, okay? And so the, now we have the gross output. The gross output is going to be distinct from the net output. The gross output is going to be equal to the means of production that are transferred over from the input side plus the newly created net output, the newly created corn. So this then becomes our relationship there. Okay, at the bottom we have this diagram in terms of our transactions table. Now we have the corn as seed and we have the corn farming labor. We now have both of them on the input side, ex ante. On the output side, we have the gross output and the net product. The net product is going to be equal to, of course, Q minus A. It's going to be equal to the quantity of the gross output when you net out the means of production requirement. Again, for the subsequent round of production, here you're going to be. Um, looking at successive rounds of production. Now, what we're going to do here, okay, we, these are our productivity relations. We have any value relations here. This, as, as the unassisted model production, we had, um, we had a physical structure production and a value structure production, and then a money structure production. Well, we're going to do the same thing with the one commodity model, but with the physical structure production, we're going to look at it a little more clearly. We're going to arrive at what we refer to as a productivity parameters. And so here, we're going to take the relation of net of the input Inputs, the means of production input and the living labor input in relation to the net output. And so we're going to look at different ratios and those are going to be our productivity parameters, okay? Prior to the introduction of value, it's important to say that. So here we got your physicalist productivity parameters and what I refer to as the productivity schedule. The net productivity of labor is going to be lowercase y is going to be equal to the net output divided by the living labor input in our one commodity model. That's going to be three units of corn per unit labor. That's going to be the vertical intercept in, of the graph below, where the graph below is going to be in factor productivity space, where the factors are going to be, I, I use a, the neoclassic term factor, factors of production, capital, or means of production, and labor. And so the factor space is going to be, uh, factor productivity space, is going to be labor productivity in the vertical axis and so-called capital productivity, quote-unquote, or uh, the, the, the uh, net output means of production ratio on the horizontal axis, which is a scalar value, and I'll tell you here. So the first one is the net productivity of labor. The second is going to be the means of production to labor ratio. I call it K. It's your capital labor ratio. It's going to be equal to the means of production divided by living labor. Um, that's going to be five units of corn per unit labor. You'll notice that the units of labor productivity and the units of the, of the labor to means of production ratio are the same. The uh, means of labor to means of production ratio is going to be the slope. And then um, negative of that is going to be the slope. And then the last is going to be the net output means of production ratio. We denote that by the uh, Greek letter rho. That's going to be equal to uh, the net output y over the means of production requirements A, that's going to be equal to 0.6. That's going to be the horizontal intercept. And so I draw this here. All right, so I put this in productivity space. Net output, the means of production ratio, so-called capital productivity, right? You're going to have the means of production, net output, or, or, or I'm sorry, the labor productivity, um, capital productivity space. And then what I try to show here is this is going to be 1. And so you can see that this is 3. Well, this is going to be 2. So this whole thing is negative 5 uh, units of corn per unit L. And it's going to be over 1, right? Because the slope is rise over the run, negative rise over the run. That's going to be equal to the negative of the slope, which is the negative of the capital labor ratio. That's your productivity schedule. That's going to be the same schedule, the same, the same graph is going to express the distribution relations to arrive at the wage profit schedule, and it's also going to arrive at the, at the consumption and investment relations, which is going to be the expenditure schedule, the growth consumption schedule. We're going to talk about that in another PowerPoint altogether. The next one we're going to do is actually going to bring it together, but it's going to be this line here. It's going to be the same, same line. This becomes your um, transactions table here. Okay, now we're going to introduce the gold sector into this. Uh, model. Okay, we're going to keep the assumption that gold is the product of unassisted labor. F physical transactions table. So you have your corn industry, five units of corn of seed, one unit of labor as input. Gross output is eight quarters of corn. Net output is three quarters of corn. Gold industry. We have no means of production. It's the product of unassisted labor. We keep the assumption of one ounce, oh, one hour, or one unit of labor is going to produce one ounce. And so here, the gross product is equal to the net product. Uh, here, we're going to have our con our, con our, con uh, our controvertible currency. 
And so that is going to be, it's going to be the convertible. And it's going to be convertible currency, uh, which is going to be a fixed exchange rate, basically. And so it's going to be our mint price of gold. And then you're going to have the uh, output here for the gold industry is going to be $3, right? Because this is really, this is the same monetary industry. The gold input, I mean, the gold is numerare and the money is numerare. And then we're going to have the unassisted gold sector is going to be converted uh, to, the, to, to the dollars, okay? This is your physical coal coefficients of production. This is going to be related for the um, for the corn industry. Okay, so lowercase a11 is equal to capital A11 over Q1, right? This is going to be the inter-industry input output coefficient, uh, 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 inter-industry coefficient, right? And then you have the direct labor coefficient, which is going to be equal to the quantity of labor divided by the gross output. That's the direct labor coefficient from the unassisted labor model as well, except for there it was net output because gross equal to net output and unassisted labor. Not so when you assist the labor with the means of production and you have to have it there. Your system of equations, right, which is actually one equation, it's two different ways you express it, is here. This is going to be the input relations. So this says here the price, oh, I'm going to go back, okay. This says here that this is going to be the price of good one at the Rth regime of distribution. Now you're looking at your distribution regimes in terms of the value of the rate of profit. But you're still going to have a pure wage remuneration and a pure profit remuneration, except for, in term, in, except for we're going to express it in terms of values of the profit rate, right? And so this is going to be the price of the corn, X1 is corn, the price of corn at whatever numerator we choose. Again, the lowercase nu looks like a V. That's going to be equal to nu is equal to our numerator. Um, at the R3 regime of distribution times the quantity of corn necessary for corn production plus the profit factor. One plus the rate of profit. And there the rate of profit at the particular regime of distribution where the regime value goes from the lower limit of the rate of profit of zero to the upper limit rate of profit, which is going to be equal to your output capital ratio. Actually, it's going to be here. All right. This is going to be the uh, the maximum rate of profit. Probably should have made that a little bit more clear. Is that your net output means the production ratio is going to be your maximum rate of profit, right? Um, here, okay, and then you add to that the wage rates times the quantity of labor and the wage rate at the particular regime of distribution, the superscript R at the particular numerator, the subscript nu. Now. You'll notice that one thing we have here, and this is follow Sraffa's framework and not Marx's, uh, Sraffa's uh, framework of keeping the wage payment out of the assessment of the rate of profit. Okay, Sraffa calls that post, or we could call that post factum wage payment, as opposed to anti factum wage payment, in which the profit rate is going to be assessed on the value of the uh, of the wage bill. Right. Uh, there's some debate over which is more pure or whatever, and that, which is ridiculous to talk about purity of the thing. It's a lot easier to do it the way that I'm doing it here because then you can really clearly see the distributive relations that we're talking about. And, and again, none of this is truth of the capital T. It's just ways in which we can understand the, the way in which uh, you know, this particular framework tries to uh, uh, model and, and, and explain capitalist capitalist reality, right? And so in any event, that's going to be the post factum wages, which we assume. Okay. And then you write it here with your input output coefficient, right? And then this uh, equation, Roman numeral two here is simply the same equation from little Roman numeral one, lowercase Roman numeral one up here when you have it in terms of the physical coefficients of production, which means that your Q falls out because you set that equal to one. All right, so this is going to be the, the, the price form, a lowercase Roman numeral two, is generally the one commodity price form that you see in a lot of, uh, a, a lot of uh, 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 you know, works, and especially works for some of the Sraffians, et cetera. Right? Distribution of the net product. Again, we're going to only be concerned with the corn sector. We're going to keep that assumption that the gold sector, which produces the invariable uh, quantities of gold, and then via the mint price of gold, is going to uh, produce the invariable monetary uh, 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 currency expression. Um, is going to be uh, not assessed with the rate of profit. So only the corn sector is going to have the profit rate assessed to it. Okay, um, and the rate of profit is here. Okay, it's going to be defined as the profit mass uh, divided by the capital advanced, right, in terms of the value relation. 
Um, so now we're going to be looking at the um, relationship between the wage share and the profit rate. And, and it's important here because uh, one of the things that Srafa does in, in, in his book, Production of Commodities by Means of Commodities, one of the things Srafa does is he um, leaves the distribution parameter open. Well, he, he really, he closes it from the profit rate. But in terms of the way he develops the framework, he, leaves a dist he develops it in terms of the distribution parameter being left open, which means that... In order to understand the different regimes of distribution, really we have to understand the uh, the wage and the profit relation in tandem with each other. So any regime of distribution is going to be associated with two distributive variables, a distributive variable of wages and a distributive variable of profits. The distributive variable of wages we use is going to be the wage share. The distributive variable of profits that we use is going to be the profit rate. So the wage share profit rate uh, uh, relationship is going to determine or is going to allow us to signify and distinguish the different regimes of distribution and that's what we're showing here the top equation is going to be the wage share so at a pure wage remuneration the wage share at the rate of profit is zero again we're keeping the superscript zero there to refer to the value of the profit rate so this is going to be uh, the wage share when the rate of profit is zero is going to be equal to unity the wage uh, share at the pure profit regime of distribution is going to be when the wage share is equal to zero. This is going to be equal to zero. All right. So here I put as a superscript the letter rho, where rho is going to uh, signify the maximum rate of profit. Right. I, I really am getting bothered by that. I need to come here, actually, and make this clear. All right. This is going to be equal to R max. All right. You would put here R max. All right, which is equal to, uh, oh, this would be on this, all right, is equal to R max. It's going to be equal to your maximum rate of profit, all right, which is going to be equal to R. All right, I should have put that here, all right, and then this is going to be equal to R. All right, on this here equal to capital R is how they express it. All right, and so that then shows what, um, what, uh, what we're looking at here, right? So we're seeing that the, that the maximum rate of profit is going to be equal to the, uh, the, the uh, output capital ratio. So we use as a superscript for the distributive variable at that maximum profit rate, pure profit rate regime of distribution, the Greek letter rho, which is the output capital ratio. And then you have the same value for the profit rate at these different regimes. So at the pure wage regime of distribution, well, the rate of profit is zero. And the pure profit regime of distribution, the maximum rate of profit is going to be equal to the output capital ratio, which, as we saw, was given in terms of the productivity parameters. And this is an important point here because what we then see is that the limits of the distribution parameter are going to be determined outside the system of value and distribution. It's huge, and it shows that, that uh, 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 I think that it demonstrates the robustness of Schrappa's theory. I'll, I'll talk more about that later. So, we have then this, this regime of distribution, and so what we're going to have here are the following price equations. Okay, so here I put the gold sector first because we're just going to use that in order to set the measure of value, and then we got the corn sector. Okay, and so we have the corn sector here. I have the corn sector in terms of the levels, and this latter equation is the corn sector when we have it in terms of the inter industry coefficients. Here we have the um, we have the real sector, right? I had this before. This is the real sector, and this is going to be the monetary sector, where the real sector is going to be, um, is going to be the various numeraire that are associated with, um, with, 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 the, uh, with corn and with, um, with a labor. Right, and so this is going to be here. I got this going. I got this, guys. All right, it's going to be here. You're going to. This is going to be your real sector, right here. So this becomes your real sector here, and the other one is going to be your monetary sector, right? Which is going to be here. Okay, and so then you take your real. I got to take this down, right? Because I have my equations there. All right, so this becomes the real sector, and this is going to be your monetary sector. Now, the monetary sector is going to be uh, devoted or, or divided between, um, between uh, consumption, I'm sorry, um, gold as a product of unassisted labor and, um, and the currency according to the mint price. Okay, I like to come over here. I like to make all these things, Garamond. 
All right, I tried this is this, and this is going to be your real sector here, real sector, all right, which is going to be there, okay, make it there, and on this way, I like to make this equal to, why not, 24, and then go this way, and then you go like this. All right, this is your real sector, okay, and then you're going to have your monetary sector. All right, this is going to be there. You take this here, and you come here, a little more room. And you're going to say monetary sector. Monetary sector. Bueno. And that's going to be there when you... Let me actually say this thing. The, the PowerPoint doesn't save. Google Slides do. So you have to keep that in mind when you're on any Microsoft product. You have to make sure you save it. Because if you don't, and then something happens to your machine. and it, Or really the problem is, is when you're just running these things so big... Um, that uh, they just it, it 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 stops, then you have the um, then you then you lost all your work right. So be sure you save it anyway. So this then is going to be the uh, the different MRR. All right. So there and here I express it generally. Okay, just in terms of the general relations there, and then you can of course plug the numbers in. And so this is what you're going to have. It's going to be corn as a numerator, labor as a numerator, the principal diagonal in the real sector is going to be unity, right? As you have the own price of both of the commodities, the off diagonal elements are going to be uh, are going to be reciprocals of one another. And I can see that this has got to also be reciprocated, right? Yeah, that's exactly what happened. You would take this, I'm, I don't want to do it in this PowerPoint, but see, this is going to be reciprocated. This needs to be on the, on the numerator here. Ah, damn it, let me do this here. All right, what you need to do is you need to come here. All right, so you take this, Control C, and you come here. It's really going to mess up my thing. All right, Control V here, Control V. All right, how did that work? Yeah, it's not too bad. All right, where this then comes here, all right, you got to take this denominator, right on, you got to take this denominator here. All right, this one here, control X, and you come up here, control V, you come here. Uh, this is what happens with this stuff, sometimes it doesn't come. All right, and you're going to have this one here. All right, control V. All right, and so this is here is going to be L1. All right, so the point here is that it's going to be reciprocal of the other one. All right, and because that's the whole point is that they're going to be they're going to reciprocate one another, and then what I would probably do is just just avoid this and come here and make this sixteen. All right, all right. it does not work, and make the whole thing sixteen. Okay, um, make it fifteen. All right, see how that goes. There you go. All right, and so you are going. To, sorry to do a little bit of that at this on the thing, but I'm going to keep going. All right, so this then is going to be the. Um, is going to be the relation here, all right? This actually is going to have to go to, all right? Corn is number rare is going to be this, and this is here. That's exactly right. This is going to be one. Bueno, now it's correct, okay? Whew. All right, there you go. All right, now we have, the, these are going to be reciprocals of each other. This is going to be the, the corn price of corn when corn is a number rare. This is going to be the corn wage rates. Okay, at the various regimes of distribution, here, this ratio here, I'm just calling a, uh, alpha sub R. Labor is a numerator, and this is going to be labor when labor is a numerator is equal to 1. And this is going to be the uh, labor value of corn or, the, or the, uh, the, the price of corn when labor is a numerator, the labor value of corn at the different regimes of distribution. Now we get into the idea of labor commanded. I got another presentation I'm going to show that looks at the relations of labor commanded in some detail. But here we begin to see that labor commanded is going to be defined as the labor as numerator values when the rate of profit is greater than zero and the wage share less than one, right? When the rate of profit is equal to zero and the wage share is equal to one, then the labor values are the labor bestowed values. There's your micro labor theory of value, your congealed labor, right? Here is our unassisted gold production, okay? And so then as per the same uh, 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 scenario, the same relations that we did for the unassisted model with the wild strawberries and gold, the, we see that the unassisted gold coefficients are the same coefficients as our labor coefficients, right? And then uh, our dollar magnitudes are going to be there according to the mint price, right? So you'd multiply that by the mint price. This is going to be the entire... The entire um, the entire thing expressed. Okay, so here I'm calling the mint price of gold the monetary expression of gold. 
Okay, kind of goes to the monetary expression of labor time and the monetary expression of utility that I used at the beginning, at the very beginning of the slideshow in that first uh, in that first video. This is your real sector. Corn is numeraire and labor is numeraire. Here I have my alpha sub R and one over alpha sub R very clear so that uh, 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 it, the matter is is very transparent. R of course is going to be the value of the rate of profit. This is going to be your unassisted gold production, right? And so then we see as per setting the price of gold equal to one, we arrive at these numerator. Now, what I've done here with the unassisted gold production is, is I've introduced two different conventions, okay? The first convention is going to be the unassisted gold numerator of type A. Here what I'm doing is I'm setting the value of the wage equal to one ounce per unit labor, and that allows us to vary the value of the corn, okay? So this is going to be the analog of what we had done earlier with respect to having gold as the um, as mimicking the labor value, right? This whole idea that the it, it, we did it over here, that the coefficients on the unassisted gold production are going to be the same coefficients that are on my labor value, right? Well, that's here. Okay, and that's what we're doing there is we're holding the value of gold equal to one, right? The, the wage, I should say, the wage, the gold wage rate equal to one ounce of gold per unit labor, and we hold that. That's going to give you that infinite price on the, um, on, on the price of corn. Alternatively, what we could do, and this is really the more common convention, is going to be have an unassisted gold numeraire of type B. In this particular relationship, we hold the price of corn constant and we vary the wage rate. And the, when we hold the price of corn constant and vary the wage rate, this gives us the downward linear, the downward slope and linear wage profit curve because the wages are going to go down. This is the, the most common expression that we're going to be using. But I do want uh, viewers here to know that whichever we choose is really by convention because we can choose whatever numeraire we want we just got to be clear about what uh, about what's happening there how whichever numeraire whichever uh, type of number of gold numeraire we choose we're going to multiply that by the monetary expression of gold or the mint price of gold and that allows us to arrive at our different money prices right and you're going to have numeraire, dollar numeraire of type A is going to be when we use gold assisted numeraire type A where the wage rate is equal to constant one ounce per unit labor. And then the money wage rate of numeraire type B is going to be the money value expression of the gold as numeraire type B where it's the gold price of corn, which is held constant, right? Anyway, so you have that. And so then what I do here is I do it for our numeric example across different regimes of distribution. The regimes of distribution here, all right, I probably should make it a lot more clear in, in, in a subsequent PowerPoint, I will. The profit rate goes from zero to 0 0.6, right? Because in our numeric example, this is it, 0.6 was our maximum rate of profit. So what we're doing is we're moving from zero to 0 0.6, and then that we're gonna get the various prices and the various uh, uh, values associated therein. So this is gonna be the rate of profit of zero, rate of profit of 0 0.2, rate of profit of 0 0.4, rate of profit of 0.52, rate of profit of 0.5999, right here, 0.5999. It's gonna be in the neighborhood of the maximum rate of profit. And then finally, we have the rate of profit at its maximum maximum value 0 0.6. The reason why we use the, um, the, the, the rate of profit in the neighborhood of the maximum rate of profit is because when you have the maximum rate of profit, your, your labor values are infinite and so too are the numeraire, uh, are, are the gold as numeraire of type A are also going to be infinite. You're going to have an infinite price and so in your Excel, I do all this in Excel, you can use whatever you want a program to use. I do Excel. Uh, it, it, you won't have the value, right? And so this allows you to see how how at the uh, at the maximum rate of profit, the exploitation rate just shoots up amazingly. Uh, uh, that we have that 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 we have here, right? And so again, following the same color code, the the the. Uh, uh, light brown, I guess, is what it is. Rust color is going to be the real sector. The gold is going to be the gold as 
is numerator sector and the green is the money and the monetary sector you'll notice that i have different monetary expressions of gold different mint prices of gold that's because of the different numerator i choose because what i want to do is i want to have the same monetary values here so when we use new gold as numerator uh, type a we hold the wage rate as one ounce per unit and so we multiply this and we get the money prices and then for the gold numerator of type b we hold the the price of uh, corn is constant and we multiply it by this other monetary expression to get the same monetary values. That's all we're doing there. It's just matters of convention in order to make the exposition easy. Then what we do is we go through and we... Um, and, and, we, and we sort this out according to the different regimes of distribution. So now we have the different sectors, the real sector, the monetary sector with unassisted gold, and the monetary sector with currency units. Okay. The first two, so we, and we separate them according to the different numeraire. The, uh, in the real sector, these first two shaded uh, rows are going to be the price when, uh, when uh, corn is a numeraire. You can see that the price of corn is always equal to one across all regimes of distribution. And you can see that the wage rate goes down from the complete wage rate of three quarters per unit to two quarters per unit labor. Uh, let me say it again. Complete wage rate of three quarters per hour or per unit labor, uh, two quarters per unit labor, one quarter, 0.4 quarter, 0 0.0005 quarters. There you get in, in the neighborhood. You can see that the wage rate goes almost down to zero. Finally, when you're at the max rate of profit, the wage rate is zero. When you express that when labor is a numeraire, here you have your labor commanded. Okay, or your labor value. So this row, this third row, or this first of this this first row in the second two rows in the real sector here, these are going to be your labor values. This is going to be the labor value of corn. Okay, and you can see that the wage rate, the labor value of the wage rate is going to be constant. This really ought to be zero over zero. In fact, I'm going to put that there. All right, this really ought to be here, zero over zero. All right, is equal to zero over zero. All right, and, and because it's uh, it's equal to one, but it's really one, right? A uh, uh, zero over zero. I don't want to do it here. All right, zero over zero is there. All right, and so uh oh, my bad. Come over. This one is equal to zero over zero. All right, and it's equal to so. So, what is zero over zero? Well, zeros cancel out, right? I mean, that, I mean, of course, it doesn't. I mean, it, it's it's. But this gives us uh, the 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 absurdity. Um, uh, it comes in capitalism, right? I mean, well, how do you measure uh, how do you measure the labor value when your measure of value is uh, is not paid? All right, and the answer is you can't. All right, and so then you have as, and, and so the point is from the perspective of the. Um, of the theory, right? The, the, the more we force wages down towards lower limit of zero, the more explosive the system can be, quite frankly. But anyway, that's going to be this relationship here. All right. And so you have the labor. Value. Now this is going to be your monetary gold sector. Remember the monetary gold sector of type A when labor is said the value of labor is equal to one ounce per unit labor or type B when the price of, uh, of, uh, of corn is equal to one ounce per unit uh, per unit corn. Right. Which are going to be here. OK. And then you get the monetary or currency sector finally there. Now I'm going to draft. I'm going to grab these latter two. Okay, when I grab these latter two, this is going, they're going to look like this. Okay, this actually, um, the, the first graph is actually going to be these last two columns. This is going to be the monetary sector um, when we have corn as the, uh, as the numeraire. Okay, or the corn price is equal to one dollar per unit. And this is going to be where you have the wage rate going down. This is going to be here. And so now I have my graphs. Okay. The first, uh, the first column here to the left is going to be money values when the price of corn is constant. And on the right hand side is going to be money values when the wage rate is constant, which is going to be the analog to labor commanded. Okay. Um, the, 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 the reason why there's two sets of graphs, okay, this is going to be one graph that is in two quadrants. So quadrant one is going to be the price of corn. Quadrant two, uh, quadrant four is going to be the price of labor. That's positive values. There's your wage profit curve. So there the price, the wage goes down. And what I do with the graph under it is I put both of those in a single quadrant. 
All right. So here you can see that as the, as the rate of profit goes from zero to its maximum value, when the price of corn is constant, corn is at a constant price and the wage rate, corn wage, the money value of wages goes down. OK, what you're saying, this is the money wage rate. OK, here's the same thing. The money value of corn is constant. The money value of wages goes down. All right. When we have the opposite situation or the other situation, when the wage rate is going to be held constant, this is going to be the analog of the wages as the numeraire, the analog of the labor commanded approach. Here we have the labor uh, is going to be equal to one. Here the empty set is going to re represent the fact that it's going to be zero over zero, right? The, the, the system collapses there, and, and, and it's, it's like a vortex. It, the, see, the capitalism collapses, right? Uh, right, right, right at that at that point, right? And so then you see that the, va that the price of corn is going to increase without limit, all right? Because you're holding a decrease in quantity equal to one, which means in relation, all other prices, in this case, the price of corn is going to increase without limit. And the second graph, I have the, um, I have the same graph in those two quadrants in a single quadrant, in a single quadrant there. Our net normalization, we come back to our net normalization and we have our, um, our value added by living labor is going to be equal to the value of the net outputs. Okay, value added by living labor is going to be equal to the value of the net output, paragraph 10, equal paragraph 12. This is going to, that now we're going to be in a situation to look at um, the double entry bookkeeping relationship with respect to the net product. And we're going to look at income account relations, which are going to be revenue relations. And we're going to look at output account relations, which are going to be expenditure relations. Foley and Michael and growth and distribution, they speak about that. That gives us our net income output accounting framework. We're on the income account, we're going to have relations of wages. And on the output account, we're going to have relations of, uh, of expenditure, right? And I'm going to relate those to paragraph 10 and paragraph 12. Here, I'm just throwing this up here. I, in the next lesson, the next slideshow proper, I'm going to develop the relationship between the income account and the output account, especially as it comes from the Foley and Michael, uh, the Foley and Michael questions. But... Um, but uh, but these are the relations here, and I'm going to go through. I will say that the conduit between the two is going to be the propensity to save. Here expresses the propensity to save out of profit revenue, and the growth rate of capital stock is going to be the output account expression of the net uh, uh, of the um, of the uh, uh, the capital output ratio. And so then you're going to see the relationship between the growth rate of capital stock and the rate of profit and the propensity to save and the Cambridge equation, all that stuff we're going to deal with um, in a subsequent PowerPoint. But it comes here. The, the theoretical point of contact begins, begins here. Okay? We have a productivity parameter then. We revisit it in terms of, in terms of money. Right? So now we're going to be expressing all of our, ratio, all of our magnitudes in terms, of, uh, in terms of, uh, of currency relations, the fixed exchange rate from the unassisted gold is per, uh, uh, industry there. We have our money, uh, our net money productivity of labor, three dollars per unit labor. We have our net means of production, I mean our means of production of labor ratio, five dollars per unit labor, and our net output means of production ratio, which is also going to, which is equal to 0.6 without any units. So the units cancel out for both the dollars as well as the um, as well as the physical units, and that gives us a relationship there. Now, in looking at the um, in looking at the um, at the question on the income account, we come here to the notion of the income account. And, and what I want to spend a little bit of time here introducing is a question of the determination of the wage. Okay, Because one of the, th one of the issues that exists, especially in Marxian theory, but in all the classical theory, has to do with how do we properly determine what, what wages are, or what is the appropriate way to understand wage determination. And in the classical, and especially the Marxian literature, there are two different ways in which the wage relation is conceived of. 
the one relation is going to be wages are conceived of as remunerations out of workers' net productivity. That's the way I'm expressing a wage relation in these PowerPoints, and that's the way in which Rafa expresses the wage, mostly in his archival notes, as well as certainly in production of commodities. That's going to be what we can call the proportionate wage in Ricardo, or what Marx refers to as the relative wage. That's here. So the relative wage considers wages as paid out of the net product and be simply expressed as the multiplication of the wage share with the productivity of labor. And that becomes your relative wage, which is going to be equal to so many dollars per unit labor, your proportionate wage. Now this is distinct from another way in which wages are going to be considered to be determined. Now, has there been a class in interpretations? Yes. Does there necessarily have to be? No. Both expressions and notions of the wage are applicable and both are relevant. So let me just say that now from the beginning. I do use the relative wage more than the commodity wage, which is the second one, and I'll talk about that. This second wage is the inventory wage or the commodity wage. The inventory wage or the commodity wage considers wages as the money price of a, a money price of the value of a given subsistence real wage bundle. Okay, so here you have the idea that there's a minimum bundle, a minimum subsistence wage bundle or real wage that workers are somehow supposed to get. All right, I'm going to leave that, I mean, whether it's the iron law of wages in LaSalle, which is minimum subsistence, which is more the Malthusian idea here, uh, as opposed to Malthus's idea, but certainly the Malthusian idea, or uh, the, the real wage can also represent somewhat of a, of a social wage, or the social and historical conditions in a particular society are going to determine what that wage is, right? I'm going to leave that the, the distinctions between the two there. I'll come back to a whole PowerPoint, definitely a whole lesson on the distinction between the inventory and the relative wage, for sure. Uh, but um, here we express it. And so now we're going to have a given quantity of corn per worker, and we multiply that by the price of corn. That gives you your inventory wage, which here is expressed in terms of so many dollars per unit labor. So the units of the wage rate are going to be the same. Here we have just two different ways in which we can express the weights. Marx uses both, by the way, okay? In Capital Volume 1, he mostly uses the inventory weights. But if you look at Chapter 23 on... Um, or I think it's chapter 23 or chapter 24 uh, on simple simple reproduction in volume one of Capital. He has he has a uh, he has a uh, chapter. I think it's chapter 24 on what he calls simple reproduction. Right? Looks uh, he he develops this idea of uh, of the um, uh, of of the relative wage, and he also talks about it in. Um, in uh, uh, money, wage, labor, and capital, uh, and there's a manuscript also called Wages, and there's an also a, uh, and he wrote that in 1849, and there's also a manuscript that he wrote in 1865 um, addressing Citizen Weston, Wages, uh, Prices, and Profits, I think, sometimes translated as Value, Price, and Profit, 1863, that one, um, but still he operationalizes the notion of the relative wage and all that, and, and, but most of the involvement of capital, he does the inventory ways. A lot, a lot of acrimony, quite frankly, between the different approaches. So in any event, we're going to have the, um, the, two different, uh, the two different notions of the weights. Okay? They're not necessarily incompatible, although there is a source of controversy. Sarafa chooses the relative wage and, 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 uh, and sort of punts on the inventory wage a little bit by talking about the distinction between the surplus and the subsistence wage. And so what we have here, we, we can think of the, then we can combine the two, which I think is the way to go. Amor Sheikh actually in, um, in his book, chapter 14 of, uh, uh, of his book, Capitalism, I have it here, Okay, that big red book, Capitalism, uh, Anwar Sheikh has um, both, he uses both. And this graph also appears there where the total wage, or the, uh, the whole wage, is equal to the subsistence portion of the wage plus the surplus portion of the wage. And then you can see that the surplus portion of the wage is going to be the variable proportion and the subsistence portion is going to be, is going to be fixed. Right, uh, input output table uh, here, we're going to have then the um, input costs are equal to the output price in terms of money, and then the value added by living labor is going to be equal to the value of the net output in terms of money there, okay? So this ends the fourth uh, video of five uh, on this PowerPoint. 
um, of the one commodity model. Here we've just expressed really in terms of the value relations. In the next and final um, a video, we're going to go through and we're going to show the distribution of the net product in the one commodity corn economy on the income account side of the story. All right, that's it. Okay, we'll see you online. Take care. Bye.